welcome back everyone as you can see i'm back on site where the telephone box is and the first part of this video is going to be me talking you through what i'm going to do with regards to surveying the fabric condition of these so as you would have seen in the last video on the ipad i now have a series of uh, measured survey drawings that document the existing arrangement and now i'm able to mark up in procreate over these uh, exactly what components are damaged what components are missing and, and what needs to be repaired and I'll also be taking photographs of each repair so that we can key into the drawings that I'll prepare later on. Okay, so as I was explaining in the last video, the way in which these phone boxes are constructed is they have a series of parts and some of those parts have been welded together to form the main cast iron body and some of them are removable. So for instance, there's a corner profile to each four corners that then has a welded screen attached to it that you know, makes up this component that runs down to the plinth and that is all one integral structural body. But then there's screens that sit in between those that take the glazing and they are a series of cast iron glazing bars that are visible externally. The glazing sits tight up against the back of those and then there's cast iron glazing beads internally that retain them in position. So we can treat this as two key parts. There's the the integral cast iron body that would need to be repaired on site. And then secondly, the removable components, many of which can be purchased online. We can document those and schedule out what we would need to purchase and replace. Or if there are any that could just be repaired, then we can certainly explore that as well. So what I'm going to do is open the elevations in Procreate and take a red pen to document all of the removable components and a blue pen to document any repairs to the the principal structure. So let's get into it and I'll keep you updated with the progress. So what I hope you can see here is how these screens work to each elevation of the foam box. So what we have is a grid of glazing bars that the glazing sits within on this ledge. Then that's siliconed in position and then these glazing beads sit up tight against the back and are riveted into the frame. Now lots of these glazing beads are missing obviously and the glazing is also missing and then we have areas of the cast iron glazing bars that have snapped off so these are what we would class as the removable components and the glazing bars themselves are the fixed so generally i'd like to keep as much as we can of the existing fabric so certainly the welded main cast iron structure but these removable components may well be cheaper to purchase new from the specialist suppliers than they would be to sandblast these back and repair them but Really, in terms of conservation principles, it would be nice to be able to salvage as many of these existing glazing beads as we possibly can, as long as they're not too far gone, which some of them are. So you can see here examples of where some of these glazing beads have really suffered from corrosion and they've delaminated and just expanded and corroded away. And that's happened to certainly a lot of them at the lower level and also the elevations that are facing Either the foam box are much more sheltered. They don't receive much sunlight and there's, it's quite damp in the gap. So these ones have suffered a lot. So interestingly, the way the doors are made is that there's this cast iron grid centrally and the, the actual frame of the door is uh, made out of timber. Clearly that's to make it as light as, as possibly can be. And then there's some heavy duty hinges fixed inside and these pretend these sort of retention or restraint straps that prevent the door from uh you know blowing off there's also this door closer which is an original feature of the k6 that automatically closes the door though it's a little bit stiff at the moment but still functional the hinges actually look in pretty good working order and so do the restraint straps just the the bolts through have suffered from a bit of corrosion and could be replaced the doors generally, though, are in reasonable condition. A uh, bit of broken glazing at a low level, but all of the glazing beads feel like they could be repaired and reused. So I've marked up all of the removable components. Now I'm looking at the sort of main cast iron body to both of them and I think generally it's in very reasonable condition. Yes, there's a lot of flake in paint, but the actual cast iron structure feels, feels reasonable. There are areas that have suffered more than others naturally, like the lipped hood over the top of the doors and, you know, the domed roof to the upper level. 
being more exposed to rainwater. And I think there's areas of the plinth at the lower level that has also suffered. But in terms of actual corrosion, a lot of it is, seems to be flaking paint because there's, there's a thick coating of layer upon layer of paint and they've probably been redecorated multiple times. And some of those coats are, are peeling away. But I'm thankful to see that the, you know, the principal structure feels pretty sound. Well, there are areas on the back of this foam box here that have taken bolt fixings before. And given that we no longer need to use any of those fixings, I think they were potentially relating to this security structure or one previously. We're going to need to allow for filling those in and sanding back and repairing that. But again, the actual body looks really reasonable. Okay, so we're almost done. Everything's marked up. I'm just going to go around now and take all of the key photographs to make sure I haven't missed anything. I'll tell you what is really useful here is the iPhone wide-angle lens and capture all of the screens in one image. So I'll see you back in the studio now and I'll show you the drawings that I produced and how we're going to format them into professional fabric condition survey drawings. <laughs> Right guys, I'm not gonna pretend like it's the same day. It's actually a couple of days later and it's, uh, it's quite a time consuming task translating the iPad markups onto, you know, sheets and then, um, you know, marking up all of the repairs. But I've been making really good progress and I now have a package of fabric repair drawers. And I'll actually include the full PDF package in a link in the description if you wanna go in and download the full pack and look in a bit more detail. Also down there will be a link to the title block that I've been using if you're interested in purchasing that. So the package starts with a site location plan. I've downloaded the CAD base tile off of CAD Mapper. By the way, I hope the audio is not terrible. There's a hedge cutter right outside the studio window. So the package starts with a 1 to 1 to 50 scale site location plan. And what this does is effectively just locates the site and the telephone boxes within the grander setting of Bridgend. And what I will go about doing soon is plotting on the line of the, the conservation area. I think it's just best practice to include a site location plan because if these fabric condition drawings were to be submitted for listed building consent, then that would be a validation requirement. The second page is a site plan. And at the moment, that's just basically identifying the site at 1 to 200. Now I've numbered the kiosks, number 1 and 2, for reference throughout all of the drawings so we know what elevation and what plan we're looking at at all times. So now we're into the set of fabric repair drawings and I always go about setting these out in the same way. So what we're starting with is a 1 to 10 set of plans through each kiosk, so kiosk 1 and kiosk 2, and then a cross section through either kiosk. So what I've done at the bottom of the sheet is established a whole range of different hatches that relate to different repairs that we've documented on site. So whether that be, you know, rubbing down the hardwood door frames and repairing for redecoration or the extent of sandblasting to the body, um, you know, replacing missing glazing, etc. Like I said, look in the description if you want to run through each of these and see what I've documented. But each of these hatches are then relating to each drawing and that just clarifies the extent and location of the repairs that we've captured. Secondly as part of the brief we were to identify priorities for the repairs. Now I've established two priorities for this package of works. The first priority is works required for public safety, security and long-term weather tightness. Now that's clearly important for the health and safety of the public given their location on the public footway but also for their long-term weather tightness to prevent any further damage given that they're listed structures and we really wouldn't want to see them deteriorate any more than they already are. And the second priority is works to reduce long-term maintenance, so maintenance to prevent some issues becoming greater issues in the future and for cosmetic enhancement. So what I've done on each of these keys is tagged whether I feel they are priority one or priority two and should the client feel like they need to manage the budget, then it may be a case of undertaking all of the priority one items first and then undertaking the priority two items second. Now, I do this for all historic buildings and fabric condition surveys anyway, as it is a matter of best practice. 
identifying what's an immediate priority and what can fall into a longer term maintenance plan. And finally, we were to provide targeted photographs of each of the repairs. So in the photograph key here, I've established this symbol and this symbol will relate to a photograph file separate to the drawings that I've numbered. So for instance, the plans here have, you know, photograph one, photograph two, and the separate photograph file will have each numbered photograph. So somebody can just easily cross reference. So this setup really exists for all of the drawing sets. So that's drawing 102. And I have a series of other drawings that follow this, which are relating to elevations. So as I flick through, we have elevations of kiosk one, elevations of kiosk two, cross sections through both kiosks, one looking at the back interior elevation relating to works to the, the back box and the light fittings and one facing the door relating to works to the restraining straps and the shackles, the hinges and the door closers and any other works to the interior. And you'll see that also all of the photographs that we've taken on the site are keyed into specific areas. So with all of those drawings set out, that clarifies the extent of repairs. Now the brief importantly had a requirement to provide costed schedules of repair. Now I've been looking into this in quite a level of detail and I've included a sheet here which has three different schedules on it relating to the cost of the repairs. So the first schedule is looking at the spare component parts that can be purchased online through approved retailers. And I've gone through each of our repairs drawings and quantified the number of spare parts that we need. And even down to the specific telephone box paint and the colors required. So that's just really the baseline figure of the materials we would need to order to put these kiosks right before we consider the specialist labor that is required to actually fit each of these parts and to undertake the other repairs to the physical cast iron body. So secondly, I have a, a schedule which is being developed in liaison with specialist suppliers across the nation. So there are a number of specialist kiosk restorers. Very often what they require is the telephone boxes to be taken away from site, delivered to their workshops, where they'll be sandblasted down entirely. All of the component parts will be stripped and then they'll be redecorated, repaired, and all the component parts put back together. Now that's a really good way of, of treating the kiosk, but of course it requires them to be lifted from site, which can be quite an intrusive thing to do to them, particularly if they're listed buildings like these. And it's also pretty expensive, which reflects the level of craft and time required by these specialists. So I'm due to receive a cost for those specialist repairs and the off-site restoration, but as a means of sort of reviewing whether that's workable for this project, I've also prepared a schedule of works for actually undertaking an in-situ repair using local suppliers, which I think would be great if we could engage with local skilled trained people to undertake each package of repair. And so now that we know the parts cost a fixed figure, I'm going to have a load of calls with local skilled trained people, and hopefully that will come out as a more cost-effective way of undertaking these repairs. And finally, the last sheet is our designer's risk assessment. So as architects, we're obliged under the CDM regulations to identify any foreseeable risks associated with our work and to uh, establish ways in which we might mitigate those risks. So that is what this sheet is all about. It's identifying what might be considered general risks and it's also scheduling out all of the specific risks associated with the with the works we've identified. So clearly a lot of risks could exist with the interface with the public. We need a very secure site boundary and that will protect the site works like the sandblasting from coming into contact with the public. So another potential risk is given the age of the structure. Some of the early layers of paint may be lead based and if we're proposing to sandblast lead based paint that would be releasing toxins into the air and that they could also be in contact with not only the workers but the public. So by going through and scheduling out all of these potential risks, it allows us to mitigate those, whether that be with a certain strategy for the site hoarding, what PPE needs to be worn, does there need to be any pedestrian management in place for the duration of the works. So this is a legal requirement, but also a very important part of all of our work, really. So I hope you found that a valuable run through of how I prepare fabric condition drawings. And do check out that link in the description if you want to see these in, in more detail. So the next step is really the exciting part. I'm going to wrap up the costs associated with each of these works and continue liaising with tradespeople. But 
now I'm really moving on to part two of the study, which is preparing a series of concept designs for future reuse. So stay tuned for the next episode where I'll run you through my thought process and a series of exciting ideas for how we might repurpose these telephone boxes for other uses.